Welcome back to Raid Guides in a Trench Coat featuring Arcadian M1 Savage. Black Cat. A missed opportunity for a really good M9S joke. Look alive, folks, because this cat has nine. Unironically, this tier has some of the best voice lines and boasts the only Lollafell I think I've ever actually cared about. Matem is my son, and if he ends up being the M11 fight, then A, called it, and B, I'm going to stop playing Dancer so that I can learn to heal my broken heart. And because I can't unhear it, I'm going to fuck every single one of you over by pointing out that the music for this fight is an artistic recreation of Persona 5's Rivers in the Desert. In the style of being the Gigantamax gym leader music from the Sword and Shield OST. So instead of leading into this fight with a raid wide and a few auto attacks, the Arcadian starts us off like a machinist with the new level 100 America skill, with guns a blazing. Rush the arena with the force of college pledges who can barely identify Greek yogurt, let alone Greek life, and then hold steady in your clock spots. And it'll definitely feel like a bunch of college freshmen because the party finder descriptions and marker dance situations are going to be a mess of clockwise, counterclockwise, hopefully DPS first, but maybe support first, and who the fuck knows what other weird stratagems have come out in the time between writing this script and releasing this guide. God, it's fucking PIS all over again. We started with different baits, now we use same baits, and all of the options I've listed in the past 30 seconds are for the first two hits of this first mechanic. My personal preference for this mechanic is DPS first, support counterclockwise, DPS clockwise, same baits, despite what any of the footage is actually showing, which translated into gameplay means that while I'm fighting for my life with Dancer's new opener, all the DPS sit right on the intercardinal clocks box tight to the center of the arena, not whatever weird position the tank has pulled the boss to, where they then wait for those near baited proteans to go out. The DPS then run to their designated cardinal spots and supports replace them on the intercardinals before all grouping up together as the two proteans echo themselves. Thus begins some tank shenanigans before we're met with pandemonium sneaking a duality of souls mechanic into our good season of the Dawn Servant. Obvious cat claw in need of claw trimming is obvious, and then you'll quickly dodge across the medium to the other side. Remember the order because this fight is all about Black Cat having 8 plus 1 lives and she's expending two of them right here to do the exact same half room cleave patterns from two different spots. This leaves an employee appreciation of luncheons worth of pizza slices because everyone rushes to get into the first piece and then only once everyone has had their first can they all swarm to the opposite end of the table for seconds. But of course because we're waiting for Jacob to stop flirting with customers before we get started it's going to take a whole patch cycle for this mechanic to go off. To read the mechanic most effectively, find the smallest distance between the two clones that spawn, and if the safe spot was right first, go to the right of the right clone, and if the safe spot was left first, then go to the left of the left clone. And then if that mechanic seems slow, the next mechanic is a blur, because the boss will cast double or quadruple swipe right as you get your hands on that second pizza slice, and you need to resolve that with your partners for quadruple, and with your left right light parties for double, because of course 4 is 2 and 2 is 4. Then the double quadruple swipe is stored inside of clone number 3 as Black Cat sets up for another round of baited proteans except she's leaping to one side or the other. Do your baits around where she's going to be and then group up into your partners or light parties again while the echoes come out before she immediately releases that clone's attack. Insert raid wide here as we enter the Mauser phase where Black Cat jumps up to Minecraft's bleep 75% of the arena and you just need to remember which tiles to not stand on while also not dodging off of the edge. Some of the most efficient stagehands I've ever seen will then partially repair the stage and you'll be left with a 2x4 checkerboard of repaired and rickety tiles. Black Cat will summon clone number 4 who marks one player as its prey. If a DPS is the first player marked, then all of the DPS will get marked in this phase, and vice versa if the first mark is a support. If you're marked, head on over to your designated whole tile which is Light Party 1 north or west depending on the orientation, Light Party 2 south or east, and then healers in ranged far while melee DPS and tanks are near. Everyone else should avoid lateral intersections with whatever tile the player decides to stand on, but we'll get back to that in a minute. The Prey should take a look at the clone who will either have her paw high up in the sky as if getting ready to really beat down on some bongo cat bongo drums, or she'll be holding it lower at her side, primed to table flip if she lands on boardwalk for the third time in a game. After a short duration, the clone will blink behind you and... If the boss's paw was high, then make sure you're on a clean tile because she's going to stun, slam, and crack the floor beneath your feet, which will cause it to break if it's already damaged. 
If the boss's paw was low, then, well... <laughs> Your goal when getting Shuckster is to land on a clean tile for one of those epic anime floor-shattering impacts without actually shattering the floor and condemning your team. It doesn't matter if the floor beneath your feet is solid when you're hit so long as it is when you land. No matter which mechanic you get, the boss will send out a shockwave to all cardinal tiles from wherever she hits you, which is why the other seven players need to be standing away and be sure to not be within your warpath. The Szechuan secret sauce of this mechanic is that you're only ever being launched the length of a tile's diagonal and someone did the trigonometric function to learn that if you always line yourself up with a clean corner facing the opposite corner of your tile, you'll survive regardless of if you get stunned or launched. Party Finder took this like a cat with a roll of toilet paper to mean that no matter which mechanic you're getting, you're going to stand on your designated clean tile so that they can firstly predict where you are, and secondly don't need to worry about you misreading it and getting launched on top of them. If a bit of card counting is your game, you'll get two slams and two knockups, but if you're going to change how you solve a mechanic based on the information, then make sure you're actually reading it right. After all four players have been preyed upon, Black Cat will tank bust and telegraph an unmitigatable knockback. Light Party 1 needs to get knocked back to the northern corner that's getting quickly repaired by hobbyists with a grudge, rather than the corner being repaired by whichever civil service department is in charge of filling potholes in public roadways. Light Party 2 should do the same in the south. Get knocked back and then DPS should hang right, support should hang left, melee should gap close in and then the ranged players should just do their best not to clip anybody. The floor will finish being repaired across the board just in time for us to be launched into the most mind-boggling three-dimensional chess of a mechanical sequence. It starts out slow with another jumping to a side while striking either left or right, although for the sake of explanation to come, we're going to call it either inside or outside. Outside meaning only this outer block of four squares gets cleaved, and inside accounts for the other twelve. Dodge the first strike, and then the second strike, and then Black Cat will play her fifth clone face down in either the north or the south. The boss will then turn to face the center of the arena, jump to a side again, and do a round of baited proteans. This is another contentious part of the Party Finder copy and paste spaghetti because some groups will do this true north relative where if you're northwest clock you're always going to be northwest clock, or they'll want to do it boss relative for the two GCDs of melee uptime that anyone with half a green parse could true north through. Regardless of how you resolve the mechanic, the boss will put down clone number 6 directly opposite clone number 5 and now you have to reconcile what these clones are going to do in the few seconds before they start doubling mechanics and passing you to the next pull. So in this marker set you'll notice the locations of 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are all options for where the next mechanics take place. For each of the stored mechanics, the boss heads strafed a certain direction which will be part of the clone's movement. The north clone will either go to 1 or 2, and the south clone will either go to 3 or 4. The first one is easy to tell because it just went east or west like these are about to, but for the Protean mechanic clone she had turned to face center and went left or right center relative, resulting in a north or south jump. To add another Q's worth of abstraction, while the south clone is facing north so it'll just go whichever way the corresponding mechanical jump went, the north clone is facing south so it will go opposite. Wrap your head around the directional jump of whichever clone she tethers to first and get ready to repeat that mechanic in that position but with yet another added step. For the outside inside quarter three quarter cleaves, two line stacks will be added which should be taken as light party 1 to the north of the boss and light party 2 to the south of the boss. Note that the beam mechanics do not originate from her clone, so if your tank is doing some unique uptime positioning for a later mechanic, you'll need to reorient accordingly. That one isn't so bad, but if it's the Protean clone that's getting tethered, then either the DPS or supports will get marked with spread markers and whomever doesn't have said markers are going to be forced into baiting first. Adjust yourself to the intercardinals of the marker, and then the group who started with the spread will bait second before holding up to generally avoid the potential Venn diagramming of the spread markers which have matriculated onto the other group. Conversely to the light parties, these proteans bait from the clone, and not the boss who will always end up centered on these markers. Again, between those two clones you aren't guaranteed to get one over the other first, so it's best that you read and memorize the mechanics for yourself, or hope that your macro slave fizz range isn't preoccupied with recording a video to put on YouTube. Uh, just kidding, they don't trust me with macros. Following those clones, we get hit for some spicy damage and then re-engage into Mauser 2. Dodge the furry, I mean flurry of blows, and then you'll get repaired into the same 2x4 shape platform. Whichever roles did not get stunned or knocked up will have their turn with clone number 7 to either start planning their gender reveal party or get disrespectfully slammed into the end zone. It's a boy! Meanwhile, everyone else will have a secondary level of new mechanic to deal with as, on top of the cardinal tile dodging, you'll either get the very telegraphed overshadow line stacks or the relatively untelegraphed roll stack splintering nails. The line stack is pretty easy, but for the roll stacks, the melees and tanks are going to start having a tussle over how the main tank has been orienting the boss for position as all fight, so they'll have to be separated by the jaded and underpaid babysitting healers. I now understand why healers are green. 
On the chosen tile, the DPS should all hug the rightmost edge as you face the boss, the tanks hug the leftmost edge, and much like that other gemstone, the diamond in the center is the healer's best friend. Go through two knockups, two slam downs, as well as two line stacks and two roll stacks. Best I can tell, these don't correlate, but you will definitely always get two of each. Group up for the same knockback shenanigans as before, and then we're going to release the dogs so that it'll only be raining cats. I'll be honest, I have no idea how you solve this mechanic normally, but Party Fighter seems to like the MTTT strategy, which when I first saw it, I thought was a call-out post for how infrequently people use their mitigation. Group up with Light Party 1 inside of the hitbox, Light Party 2 outside of the hitbox, and then the melee steal these tethers to stand exactly on the line of the hitbox while pointing the tethers north. They'll get hit once, and then the tanks will relieve them of their duty, the party will shift to being on the south edge of the hitbox, and then it'll be the tanks' turn to involve everything from the comfort of being deep inside or far outside of the hitbox. The tanks will then take three such hits, hoping that they don't die to a mistimed invuln, and then for a min eye level party, there's only one last mechanic to go. There's also a Starmie, Starfy version of this pattern for another singular true Northless GCD of uptime, but if you can get a pug group party finder to do it correctly, then I'll bow down to you. Predacious Pounce is going to plague the real estate of the arena with a number of these massive pink AoEs foreshadowing the next fight in the tier. While these are telegraphing and then subsequently going off, there will be one last mechanic hidden in the center that my dumbass can never see. What do you call it when the field is so clouded in mechanics that you can't see anything? Cataracts. Hidden in the good old fog of Devow War, the 8th and final clone will be lining up for half room Fleas, which you should dodge if you can, but even as a Fizz range I've managed to survive one hit of that so long as I've dodged the dashes correctly, so use your best judgement. With that out of the way, you've got about 15 seconds left before Black Cat eviscerates the entire arena like it's the final round of a Fall Guys game, so choke out the last of her health bar, and then, congrats! You've completed M1S. Be sure to miss time or make mistakes on miscellaneous mechanics to amass some of the right side loot, because remember the age-old adage, scuff equals stuff. Look, if a Reaper who can't even hit their guaranteed positionals and a Sage who couldn't noom with a broadside of an 18-wheeler can stumble their way through a clear party and clean up three of the four drops, then clearly we've all been playing the game wrong. Go watch a real guide. <laughs>